Uh, other patients or many other patients also are concerned about the level of the functioning. Uh, ideally, all patients uh, should be concerned about that, you know, trying to function well in family, at work, or in the community. There is some percentage of patients that show some degree of indifference. I don't know why I'm here. Uh, my doctor sent me here, or I have uh, seen so many doctors that I don't 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 care that much. And uh, this is this is something that might be a little bit uh, concerning. Might be a difficult problem to deal with in the clinic. Uh, trying to go for the first uh, type of questions or the set of questions, uh, patients say, "I want to get to the root of the problem." And again, what, what is causing my headache? Uh, and that kind of questions uh, is uh, telling the doctors that we really have to pay a lot of attention. And what we do is we do a detailed history, uh, which brings us probably 95% the right diagnosis, but a detailed examination too. Uh, the reason for that is to rule out red flags uh, that indicate that underlying uh, the headache is a, a disorder that has to be addressed specifically, and it might be serious, it might be even life-threatening. Life so we really want to rule out those red flags, but most of the time we are able to do that and uh, to diagnose a patient with a primary headache disorder uh, in all settings. In the primary care office, more than 90 more than 90 percent of the headache turn out to be a primary for which we don't have a specific cause there are multiple causes of the secondary headache disorders that can be ruled out and uh, we are we are that's our job to do um, one of the most common misdiagnoses for migraine is sinus headache uh, it studies have shown that more than 90 percent of the time if a patient says i have a sinus headache or the patient was told by a doctor uh, you have a sinus headache that turn out, turns out to be migraine. Uh, and it's not just the location of the pain here that uh, leads to a diagnosis of headache due to a sinusitis, so inflammation of the sinuses. You need to have uh, some local symptoms like swelling on tendon, tenderness or redness or thick green discharge coming out of the nose or fever. Uh, to make it as a cause of the headache other, other than migraine, and you need to treat that specifically with antibiotics. Uh, what the patient described for migraine refers to various uh, description of the pain, and it can be you know, just barely annoying pain on one side of the head in the front, but you can see the expression of the patient uh, dissatisfied. But uh, other times it goes through various levels of despair in, uh, in a way the headache is described like, uh, I cannot get underneath of uh, the whole world um, or my head is exploding and some patients would do anything to, and we will take whatever medications are there to try to get rid of it. It's not your everyday headache. And this is an example of a real patient, although not the real name that I saw, a 28 year old woman with a history of migraines since uh, early teenage, uh, who had to interrupt high school at some point due to frequent and severe headaches. She described it as a pressure or throbbing in the front temples going to the back. Most of the time, her headache is manageable and does respond to over-the-counter analgesics. But interestingly, she des describes a roller coaster of the frequency of her headaches over years. Um, above and below this line that uh, it's 15 days per month, which is conventional is somewhat arbitrary for us to, to say what's be above that line is called chronic migraine, what's below that line is called episodic migraine. Um, when I saw her in the clinic, she was scoring high levels for impact, uh, which is this questionnaire, and disability, MIDAS questionnaire. She was scoring low for depression, which is an advantage for a patient with migraine, makes it a little bit more, uh, a little easier to treat. Her exam was normal. We didn't have any red flags. She was taking uh, no daily medication except the oral contraceptives. And for her headaches, when they would come, would be more bothersome. She would take either simple analgesics or something specific like frovatriptan. Very rarely an opioid. Rarely should go to the emergency room. She was overall functioning, and I think she still uh, 
functioning well right now. So that at that time, my job was to offer her preventive and abortive options. Um, this study uh, shows that yes, many patients can have similar pattern of roller coaster with the frequency of their headaches in migraine. Again, that line of 15 days per month. Uh, in the left panel, uh, you see a number of patients that start with um, uh, episodic migraine, but over the next couple of years, they can go into chronic, then down episodic. But in the next couple of years, things get uh, all, all over the place. Um, and our goal is to try to do our best to keep the patients below that line uh, as low as low as possible. And sometimes with treatment we can, sometimes uh, does biology of whatever happens in someone's life doesn't allow us to do that. Similarly, if some a group of patients start with chronic migraine, so above 15 days per month, can go for a year or two in that pattern uh, below or above that line, but then in the next couple of years goes again all over the place. Uh, so it's, it's ongoing evaluation that we need to make with the patient ongoing effort for the patient to understand what contributes to make that, uh, that pattern and how can we make it better. I want to spend a minute, I think it's worth, to look at this uh, chart that was put together by Dr. Andrew Charles. I stole it from him, but it's saying what is actually a migraine attack. A migraine attack, for the most part, it's a headache. This is what uh, many patients would uh, refer to that lasts between four hours and uh, three days. Um, but it's not just a headache. During, during that headache phase, uh, I would feel uh, sensitive to light and uh, would have neck pain, tiredness, nausea, and um, touching the skin of the face on the head would feel like it hurts uh, instead of feeling just touch. Uh, but if we ask patients, uh, the majority of them would report hours before or a day before, a couple of days before the headache phase, so no pain in the head at all, but that those symptoms are there, light and noise sensitivity, feeling very tired or irritable, uh, having nausea, yawning a lot, going to the bathroom, bathroom a lot. Uh, we don't know exactly what to do for, for these symptoms to prevent the headache, but the, the, the research is active in this area too. And I'd like to, to show the bottom of this uh, screen, there are uh, brain images that shows activity of various areas of the brain, which correlate with the symptoms during all these phases of the migraine attack. Um, the second phase is the aura, which is not in every patient, maybe one third of patients with, uh, with, with migraine attack would report within an hour before the headache starts, vision changes numbness or tingling on one side, troubles coming up with words, or more complex symptoms that are often described as uh, stroke-like symptoms. Um, and throughout aura, that, that, that can be uh, light, noise sensitivity, and other symptoms too. And the fourth phase, it's called post-drome. After the headache is it's over, uh, a lot of patients would still feel tired or have troubles concentrating or having that sensitivity to touch. Um, headache is a disabling symptom, but according to this study, it's not the most disabling symptom during a migraine attack. Um, it shows that that correlation between the, the symptom and the disability, it's highest for the cognitive dysfunction, which can be described as a worse mental effort or difficulty thinking, concentrating, and the pain comes just afterwards. And other symptoms like light, uh, noise sensitivity, nausea, yes, are disabling, but less, that's the cognitive dysfunction and pain. Uh, another disabling symptom is inability to move. So patients with migraine, as you well know, uh, don't want to move. I want to bring just the point of what is called most bothersome symptom, because it's important uh, for, for clinical trials, uh, as, as an example. Uh, for a drug to treat a migraine attack to be approved, FDA now requires uh, for that drug to provide freedom from the pain, but also freedom from the most bothersome symptom at two hours, typically. And the uh, most bothersome symptoms patients have to declare before they take the drug and uh, to have it gone um, after that. 
most disabling symptoms can be photophobia, phonophobia, light and noise sensitivity, and nausea at this time. Uh, to understand uh, a little bit about what migraine you know, pathways are, uh, I think this model chart is, is useful. In the left panel, there is a, a scheme of the brain. Uh, in the middle, it shows some deep structures called uh, brain stem with three levels and upper level called thalamus, which are relay station for the most, most part of information coming to the brain from outside through eyes, through touch, and through, through the ears. And those informations are filtered by uh, various structures of the brain. So only useful informations are perceived as such. In somebody that does have a migraine biology, which is inherited uh, for the most part, there is a, a little difficulty for the, for the brain to filter all these all this informations. And there is an enhanced susceptibility of the brain areas to respond to those information. So these kind of uh, inputs are uh, bothersome, become bothersome during a migraine attack. Uh, so in the back of the brain, there is a center for the light to be perceived and it's perceived as painful or bothersome. Similar with the uh, sounds, noise, pain as a single sensation is processed in this area. Uh, but in the front, there are uh, higher levels of processing of the pain experience, um, prefrontal cortex, for example, that allows on the patients to behave to, to the migraine attacks uh, in individuals' ways. The CGRP is a very hot topic. It's a molecule or a pathway that um, contributes to activation of the brain pathways uh, as I just described in people with migraine. Another example, uh, which I'm not gonna spend too much on, has to do with activity of the cells at the surface of the brain, how those brain cells are, and under the influence of the genetic predisposition and the stimulus, uh, which we can call triggers, that activity of the brain cells reach, reaches a tipping point that makes a migraine attack to happen. Um, switching gears to the level of the functioning, uh, which is important, I would um, just mention this example of a study that was done asking the patients uh, questions about worry, about covering household expenses, long-term financial security, uh, worrying about losing job or being laid off. Uh, and not only that, but they are asking partners of patients with migraine about, uh, is it hard for you to advance in your job? Uh, do you miss work um, to, to take care of your, your partner that has migraine or the partner of somebody that has migraine has to reduce job uh, or hours um, or has troubles advancing in, uh, in the career that uh, partner of somebody with migraine has to do. And in orange, we have patients with chronic migraine, in purple, patients with episodic migraine. Consistently over all these kind of questions, patients with chronic migraine score double or more than double compared to uh, patients with episodic migraine in terms of worry about financial security, job security, for example. Um, I had mentioned uh, this headache acceptance uh, concept uh, and a study was published earlier this year, uh, which analyzed a large number of questions, filtered that through a large number of experts and coming up eventually with uh, six questions that were found to be relevant in terms of headache acceptance questionnaires. And the, the answers were scored from one, is it never true, to seven, always true. I'm not gonna read those questions to you, but might have to do with, I must limit my activities to avoid anything that might trigger a headache or my headaches keep me from trying to be productive or I'm doing my best to live a normal life with my headaches. So the higher you score, the higher the acceptance score, the lower the disability. So it's inversely correlated. Again, this study was validated. Uh, it might be controversial, that, but builds upon other studies showing similar thing. Um, lastly, but not, not the least, uh, what to do with, with that kind of questions or that kind of lack of question. Uh, I don't, I'm not very much involved 
I may not be able to make any changes for this. What, what can, I, can I do? And I mentioned this because it's a very serious problem. Patients with migraine, uh, not a uh, small percentage have suicidal ideations uh, in uh, blue, blue bars, and some have suicidal attempts. And there are two different categories in, in that group, patients that only have migraine, patients have migraine with depression, migraine with depression, and fibromyalgia, which is pain all over the body. So if there is associated depression or depression and fibromyalgia, the suicidal ideation rate and suicidal so much. I really apologize for technical difficulties. Um, I, I was saying that there is hope, right? Because there is a lot of treatment approaches. Um, very quickly going to this pattern, there is a progression of uh, migraine from zero ever through high, uh, low and high frequency and chronic migraine. And factors that are involved in that progression can be modified or not. Modifiable factors can include uh, frequent attacks, not treating attack appropriately, obesity, overuse of uh, pain medication or caffeine, psychiatric comorbidities, stressful life events. And uh, we can actually make, make a difference by progression in the reverse way towards improvement by addressing various lifestyle changes uh, or lifestyle events, but also as doctors to uh, provide abortive and preventive therapies, behavioral treatments, non-pharmacological approaches. Um, the, as you all know, and as we talk about the treatment of migraine is multidisciplinary involves a team uh, addressing the best options for drug treatments, uh, exercise, being active, behavioral intervention, and education. And uh, patient education is what we do every time in the clinic when we speak with the patient. Uh, but patient education, it's your advocacy, you educating others, which turns out, turn out to be, gets back to you as being therapeutic. Um, this is an example of uh, lifestyle uh, factors that are significantly influencing the control of migraine. Uh, we talk about regular meals, regular sleep, regular diet. If all stay regular, there is a chance for the people to stay in the episodic part, which is the blue bars compared to the chronic migraine, which is the red bar. And it's a relative importance of not skipping meals, regular sleep, regular diet in, in this triumvirate. Uh, I know this is a busy slide, but these are preventive options uh, that we can we, we use. It's available for the patients. For the decades, this group of anti-seizures, anti-depressant blood pressure medications have been you know, borrowed from other specialties to provide decrease in frequency and severity of the migraine attacks. But for the last 10 years, we have Botox injections, which we use every day in the clinic for chronic migraine. Extremely excitingly, we have a uh, specific treatment that uh, address uh, this, this molecular pathway called CGRP. And there are injections that are easily done by the patients at home once a month or an infusion every three months, uh, which are well tolerated and uh, life-changing sometimes for the patients. Uh, it's a very important tool that we have for migraine prevention. There is miscellaneous options. I would mention some of the supplements that can be used and some of the devices that are non-invasive were created and found useful for migraine prevention. Uh, there is a busier slide that shows treatment options for acute attacks of migraine uh, that can be non-specific, ibuprofen group, for example, anti-nausea medications, a Tylenol, or combination of drugs, or combination of all these classes uh, in sometimes called cocktails. Uh, but again, uh, encouragingly, specifically, and excitingly, we have migraine-specific abortive treatments. Uh, for decades, uh, we have the triptans, which are seven of them. Um, we have the G-pans in the last year blocking uh, for a few hours uh, that CGRP receptor and getting rid of a uh, uh, attack uh, in patients that, um, for example, failed or are um, have contraindication to use triptans. And another medication called Rayval, it's also specific for migraine. And we do have the, the number of devices, non-invasive devices that are useful to get rid of a migraine attack. I'm gonna mention very briefly that opioids 
are generally not recommended because they generally not work and can make the migraine worse. And then end up by mentioning these devices which are uh, addressing the electrical activity and then borrowing this term, I'm stealing this term from Dr. Starling, uh, who used to say that uh, migraine is electric. So I mentioned to you some um, hints that the migraine activity has to do with electrical changes that happen in the brain. And we can address those by using safe um, devices. Thank you so much for your attention. And I apologize for the technical difficulties. I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Berlia. We were happy we could get you back on air with us. Um, we just have a few questions I'll go ahead and ask. How does the migraine timeline work with chronic intractable daily migraine? Um, so there is probably more than 3 million people in the US that have chronic migraine more than 15 days per month. And the smaller percentage of that, it's continuous uh, headache would, would be called 24-7. Um, we, we do what we, we can with that. There are interventions that can decrease the severity of the, the headache attacks. Uh, generally, when the headache uh, goes five, six, seven, eight out of 10 becomes less tolerable, especially if it associates nausea, light, and sensitivity. So we really want uh, for somebody that has continuous headache to make um, most of those headaches not being disabled. Um, does that answer the question, I hope? I think so. Um, Kelly, if, if you have any more questions to ask, just post those in the chat for us. Um, I'll move on to Allison's question. How important is, for, is, is it for the Botox injections to go in the specific locations you had in your diagram? Um, her new neurologist tell, tell her that it doesn't matter and won't put it anywhere in, their, in her scalp. Um, she's doing much worse where they're putting it. So the, she had that question. I personally, for the for forever, I was following the protocol with the 155 injection sites, seven in the temples, four in the uh, seven in the forehead, four in the temples, three in the back of the head, two down the neck, and three towards the shoulders. So that's the minimum. But you can build up on on that minimum and put in the injections uh, wherever is more tender. Uh, uh, more concept, more new concept is to uh, put the injections along the sutures of the skull because what we do with migraine is not trying to relax the muscle, but we are trying to prevent the release of pain signals towards the brain to all those nerves. So we do uh, target those nerves. That's why the, the places are specifically designed in the protocol, uh, but we can refine that by addressing where the nerves might be more important going through the skull uh, towards the brain. And I actually don't deviate from the minimum uh, 31 injection site protocol. What we do in addition to that might, might be adjusted, but again, targeting the nerves. Gotcha. So you go by the diagram initially, and then you just kind of go Build outside of that, depending on patients. Yeah, I don't alter the diagram, but just build upon that. Okay, Th thank you so much. Um, we're gonna move on since we are out of time, but if you have any more questions for Dr. Burlia, please put them in the chat and we will email him or we can um, figure out a way to get you in contact with him as well. So thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Burlia. That was fantastic. <laughs>